Hi everyone, it's Andy from Hobby Headquarters. Well, I'm back in the back of my store in the uh, the model kit box fort that I've created back here. Uh, I've been going through lots and lots and lots of model kits and accessories and parts and all kinds of cool stuff. And while I was digging through the uh, collection of cars, and it was like 99% cars, I did find some really old vintage airplanes too that are perfect for our uh, model museum because we can't just have cars in this museum. And there's some stuff from Hawk and very old Aurora, as well as some old Renwall original kits. In fact, the Renwall kit is very unusual. I have actually never even heard of this type of kit before, but we'll take a closer look at that in a minute. Also in this video, uh, since we're talking about 40s, 50s, and 60s lately with all the vintage kits, I also thought I would throw in a little history of the area, uh, Glendale, Arizona, where I am, directly across the street from my store. I mean, you could, I could hit it with a rock, basically, is the, the remnants of a very old and uh, kind of uh, famous, famous is the wrong word, but uh, very important uh, military installation during World War II, and it was Thunderbird Field. And it's literally, the remnants are right across the street. Unfortunately, they're tearing a lot of it down over the last few years. But what I thought I would do is show you some old vintage photos, and in those vintage photos, you can see where my hobby shop will be about 70 years later. Because out here at that time, it was nothing but fields out here. But I, I've already recorded that whole portion of the video. I've been waiting for the, the great opportunity to talk to you guys about it. I think it's pretty interesting. It's kind of cool to see all the old stuff there. So today, I'm going to give you a brief little quick walk around back here just to show you the amount of stuff that is gone and also just some of the stuff that's still remaining and then we're going to tear into these uh, old vintage airplane kits so let's get started Okay, we're walking to the back area, and if you guys watched the video a couple weeks ago, you remember how much stuff was back here. And it's down to now pretty much this right here. And here's the area where I've been filming the YouTube videos. And actually, the first three columns to the left are all empties right now. I've gone through that many things. There are still some kits over here that we have to uh, go through completely. And these last couple of boxes here are also required to go through. This right here is actually part of my fort. Those are all empty boxes right here to create this little uh, this little back area here. But this is one of the things I wanted to show you. So you see this giant, giant box. I have two of these and it is full, full of model car parts. Every kind of thing you can imagine and wheels, bodies, chassis, uh, everything you can believe is inside that box right there and like I said we have two of those and I'm gonna do something special with that later on but we'll talk about that when I actually out figure all that out but and as you can see we're gonna pull back here we've got our cool little fort and eventually not quite sure how it's gonna be yet but obviously this is where the museum area is going to be for all of the old vintage model kits and for our first kit I am going to show you what I think, in my opinion, is the most unusual kit of this entire pile of uh, vintage 50s and 60s kits. And this is from Renwall. Now, I have owned a hobby store for about 27 years between my San Diego store and the Glendale store that I'm currently in. And I buy collections all the time. Thousands and thousands of kits have come through my hands. And also, I grew up in the 1970s and built airplanes all the time as well. And I never have seen or remember doing any of this one with this right here, the Aero Skin. It's from Renwall, like I said. And the Aero Skin, we're going to pull this out. The box is a little, little torn and frayed. But the Aero Skin is a, a tissue-like paper that has been printed, I have to say, pretty nicely too, with all of the markings, the colors, everything you would put onto the airplane. And according to the rear instructions, here we'll flip these over and I'll show you. Here, here are the instructions on it. So it says no painting skills needed. You just roughly cut out the pattern and then you use brush liquid cement 
So I wonder if it's the same kind of liquid cement that we've been using, you know, right along to glue the plastic parts together, and then it somehow bonds, or maybe it softens the plastic enough that the tissue paper will stick to it. Hello, future Andy here. Actually, when I started filming this video, I did not have the instructions to this kit. They were not in the box. And after I got done filming all of that, I did find them. So what I'm going to quickly do is just show you the instructions because I started going through them and it is talking about the application. And the application does say that, that the material bonds to the plastic because the liquid cement slightly dissolves the plastic around it. So it is that way and the pores of the of the canvas, you know, the fake canvas covering, bonds into it. And you can actually put multiple layers of this stuff on top of each other. So, now, I don't know how well it works, but clearly uh, they thought it did. Of course, I don't know how long these kits were made. I've never, like I said, never heard of them. So they may have been a type of thing that didn't work as well as advertised. But you can see the instructions here. I'll show you those as well. How the kit went together. Obviously, not very difficult the way they have it set up here and then finally some of the other pieces but the uh, oh and there's the 19 1967 on it there so there you go so let's go back to the video but a very unusual thing and this is what I want to show you on too is the airplane itself is has the ribs already built into it so this was obviously a uh, canvas covered airplane that they would uh, you know, put over the, the canvas on top of the, the ribs here to make it really lightweight. And to give it a look of, you know, authentic look, they went ahead and molded it like this and then give you the tissue paper. Now, because of this, if this mold even exists anymore, I doubt what we'd ever see a repop on this because of the type of thing. I don't think they're ever going to bring out a tissue paper type like that. But just, just never have seen this before. And I thought I would bring it to your guys' attention. I'll show you the actual, the rest of the kit. So we've got our upper and lower wing, which both have the ribs on it. And, oh, this is inside here. This was inspected by. So if you have a complaint, this guy was going to get in trouble right here. And then all of the other pieces have the ribs cut into it as well. So, And then as for the fuselage, fuselage is just, just the way it was. Minor detail on it. And then you would just cover this over right there. So, uh, like I said, it's a very unusual kit. Oh, actually, here's the other sprue, too, with the parts on it. So, actually, a decent number of parts on it, and, uh, and a lot of detail that if this comes out okay, it would probably look really cool. And then, I guess, at the time, Renwall was coming out with a whole bunch of different airplanes, so some World War One, mainly, actually, mainly World War One. But there it is. So, let's move on to the next one. Since we are looking at some vintage aircraft from the uh, 40s, 50s, and 60s, I thought I would take a moment out of this video and talk to you about some cool real history. Now, right outside my front door and across the street, there is a big, uh, big area full of buildings that, to the average person that drives by, doesn't even really think twice about it. But this is the actual remains of what used to be Thunderbird Field Number 1. Now, over the last uh, 70, 80 years, it's been a lot of different things. It was, for the longest time, the Thunderbird School of Management. It was part of ASU for a while. It was a Christian college. And now it is uh, some other kind of school that is going in there. And he, as you saw a minute ago, there was lots of bulldozers and stuff. And they're, they're sadly gradually tearing down all of the old buildings. Now, this picture I've, I've taken right outside the front of my store, you can see the remains of what the tower is uh, still there with the windsock. That is all still there, but little by little, a lot of the old buildings are getting torn down. Now, I've got a bunch of vintage 1940s uh, pictures to show you as we go through it here. Uh, a quick little history on this. So, back in the late 30s, uh, a lot of people saw that the handwriting on the wall, that the war was going to erupt and eventually take everybody with it. And General Hap Arnold wanted to start a bunch of civilian training bases to get people into learning how to fly. Unfortunately, Congress didn't see the same way as he did, so they didn't give him any money for it. So he went around to a bunch of private investors to try to start a bunch of basically air, uh, you know, airplane training facilities to get guys into being pilots. 
And this particular one across the street, Thunderbird Field Number 1, was actually backed by a couple of famous actors, including Jimmy Stewart, Henry Fonda, and Cary Grant, all contributed to getting this off the ground. So the training facility opened in 1941, and of course, we all know, a few months later, the war erupted, and of course, the, the government took it over. And during that time, 15,000 pilots were trained at Thunderbird Field Number 1. In fact, if you look at some of the pictures that we're going to be showing you right here, you can see, and I have to admit, for the longest time, I never really noticed it, that all of the buildings are in the shape of the uh, the Thunderbird, the mythical uh mythical bird and I've I don't know why I just never never saw it you know most of the buildings are gone now but uh, as you can see from some of these pictures here that it is in the shape of a Thunderbird the the coolest thing is is I'm going to show you these pictures as we go through here is that eh, what do we say 70 years later a really cool hobby shop was going to open up in that desert field right across the street from Thunderbird field and that's where I put the big blue X on all these pictures of where my store would eventually turn up. Another interesting fact was in 1942, the movie Thunderbirds was actually shot um, at the airport here. And kind of cool if you can find it. Actually, part of it is on YouTube. I was able to look at some pictures on there. And you can see a lot of the, the empty desert that, uh, that Glendale, Arizona was in the 1940s. Another fun fact was, from what I've been able to read, I I'm, haven't been able to completely determine if this is true, but in 1946, once the war was over, that the entire 1,640 acres that surrounded this were all sold as war surplus. And from what I read, they said there was only one man who turned up and claimed it all and was able to buy every bit of it for a dollar. Now, a dollar sounds like a ridiculous amount of money right now, you know, for such a cheap price. But we do have to remember 1940s, and this was out in the middle of nowhere. This was just all desert scrubland out here. So, uh, you know, it kind of depends on what he thought was a good deal, and obviously nobody else wanted it. So that is a, a quick little little history about that. There's lots of other things you can look up online. Another little fact about all this as well is this was became Thunderbird Field number one. Thunderbird Field number two eventually became the Scottsdale Airport. Thunderbird Field number three became Falcon Field out in the East Valley of Phoenix. And finally, Thunderbird Field number four became Sky Harbor International Airport, which is if you're flying into Arizona, mainly Phoenix, you're going to fly into Sky Harbor. Next up, we are going to take a look at two really old Aurora Curtis Hawk P6E kits. And you'll notice on this kit right here how it says quarter inch scale. It actually you have to pay attention to the inch part because a lot of people think, oh, it's quarter one fourth scale. It's not, it's quarter inch scale. And that was the popular way of saying 40A scale back in the day. Now, the reason I'm showing you both of these kits first is because we have two boxings of the same kit pretty close together. One is from 1955, 56, and the other one is from 58. Now immediately when I first looked at these boxes, I assumed one was newer than the other, as you can imagine, but I chose wrong actually. Which one do you guys think is the older of the two kits here? Um, and then I'll let you say that out loud, tell me which one you think, and I'll explain to you what I mean. I actually thought this was a newer kit. When I first saw this, I, I don't know, the way this is put on right here, it looks like an afterthought and a little bit more modern symbol. So I pictured this one to actually be in the 70s, but I went up on scale mates, looked this up. Turns out this is the older of the two kits. This one actually came out, scale mate says 1955, the instructions say 1956. So that's why I'm calling a 55, 56 kit. And obviously we have the price printed on it at 98 cents. But this kit, this kit came out in 1958 when they changed the box around. So they took the 98 cents off the cover and they took this, what I picture to be a little bit more modern symbol and replaced it with the, uh, the Aurora that growing up is the one I always knew. Never, never actually saw this one before, always remember that one. And even changed the side art of the box as well. And one thing I should point out to you too, it's still very common on Japanese kits. But back in the uh, the day, in the 50s and 60s, you'll see that it, the kit number is 116, and then the 98 corresponds to the price. So this was a 98 cent kit, 
regardless of which one it was. In fact, as we look at some of the older kits too, we've got here a, uh, a really tiny uh, F100 Super Saber from Aurora. And it's funny how they changed the price on it. So originally, so, sorry, this side here, this was a 39 cent kit, but sometime they realized, oh, this kit's gone up in price. So they covered over the 39 cent with a 50 cent uh, moniker on it there that they just dropped a sticker on. And we're gonna show you all these in a bit, but all the companies followed suit. So here was a Hawk kit, $1. Here was a Lindbergh line kit, 79 cents. And then another Aurora kit at a dollar, which let's see if we knew what the old price on this one was. Oh, it went up two cents. So it went from 98 cents to a dollar. So. so now that we've uh, talked about some of the old boxings and stuff on it there, let's go ahead and just take a quick look at the kit inside. Let's start off by taking a look at the instructions and how different instructions are back then compared to now. Now, I mean, now you think about it, you're going to get a step-by-step -step pictogram of how the actual kit goes together with very little verbiage about it. Back then, 1956, there's that uh, 56 that I was telling you about. This is the entire model going together, one page basically. But then look over here, all of this is step-by-step -step in words of how to put it together. Now, obviously reading is great, but actually seeing the picture I think is so much more helpful because sometimes it's hard for someone to explain certain parts and how they go on. So although I think this is cool, I am very happy with the way the instructions are today. And then we'll just flip this on over because the coolest part of the entire thing is all the advertising in my opinion. And look at some of the cool stuff that was coming out on all these things here. So. We have the uh, the ME 109s, the Hellcats, the Lightnings. Um, what is this thing? The Ver oh yeah, the Pogo. I remember that kit actually, uh, and Viking warship, and even a Chinese junk. So, and before we actually look at the kit, what I thought I would do is show you the instructions from the other boxing that came out just a couple years later. Uh, and on this one right here, the other side is identical, other than that they were selling their paint, uh, advertising it a little bit more on this side, but on here. Totally different. Look at how they were pushing all their, their soldiers and figures, and even the little Dutch girl here, and then a little breakdown of all the kits that they had out at the time. Now let's look at the plastic. Okay, let's first take a look at the, uh, the main runner here that has a lot of the parts on it. And this sprue right here is, you can see, pretty basic. It's just a long runner down the middle, and all of the little parts coming off of it. And if you guys watched the video I did on Johan models, Johan in the early 60s came out with the idea of putting the sprue all the way around the edges of it to protect the model kit. This is why on these kits, you know, they'd bounce around in the box and parts would eventually pop off. But you get a general idea of what they look like in here. And this, when we're looking at the, uh, the fuselage of the airplane, you'll notice that all of the decal markings are molded into the airplane. So here's our Eagle. So I guess you could just go back and either paint it. They did come with decals of this, but I guess for the modeler who just wanted to go on and paint, you could do that. The numbering is all on the side. The, uh, the upper wing, same thing. There's the, uh, the star and the ribbing on it there. A another sprue here with all the little parts on it. I wonder what makes this one, other than polishing out those molds really, really well, this plastic so much shinier than what we see today. And the other side of this, we've seen already our wings. Most of the parts are starting to fall off this kit after sitting for so long. But you see the giant army written on that wing there. And then I'll pull this out. So. What do you guys think? Do you think those decals would work if we threw them in some water? I think they've yellowed just a slight little bit over the few years. So <laughs> it is pretty amazing that they're not cracked. I mean, they would probably disintegrate beyond belief once we put them in water, but uh, still interesting nonetheless to see them with their little instructions in there. And then they came with a little plastic stand as well in there to keep your airplane flying if you wanted to, just like that. 
Also, I have another uh, old Aurora kit here. This is the SBC-3 Helldiver, also in quarter inch scale, and it has the older Aurora lined symbol on it as well. Looking it up, this said this kit was also 1956, so it came out at the same time. We won't really dig into this one too much more other than look at the instructions on the back. The exact same uh, set of instructions for that, and then these are almost identical the way they are, other than the airplane. I know the airplane is different, so they have to put it together differently. But you can see the instructions were very common that same way there. And just briefly, you can see, same thing. All those airplanes at the time had the markings actually molded into the body. Next up, we have a very old Hawk kit. And a old Hawk kit with the uh, quarter inch scale again or 40A scale to you and me in modern times. And on the side here, we're gonna take a look here. It says 1964 on it. And that's the copyright date that they actually came out initially with this airplane. And please, I do understand the fact that this kit could have come out later. I pointed that out in the last video about the car kits and they were well, it couldn't have come out in 49 because the airplane on the instructions was it was a different airplane that didn't come out to 51 and I, I fully understand that I even pointed that out in the video but people were still pointing that out to me after I pointed it out to them this one did come out in the 60s did it come out in 64 maybe uh, could have come out in 65 66 somewhere around that area it's old though it's older than me let's put it that way so let's just take a quick peek inside and this is this is the thing I wanted to point out to you now that I I don't know why it struck me as a little unusual so the markings inside this airplane are American markings on this side and also we have uh, Israeli markings now in 1964 when this kit was the first to come out um, Israel was still a, a a new country and it's very common to see Israeli markings on airplanes and stuff now I did for some reason I just didn't picture that we'd see a lot of Israeli markings in the 1960s but you could do a p51 Mustang in either American or Israeli markings and then we'll briefly take a look at the instructions here the instructions on the Hawk kit just a few years after those Aurora are much more in detail uh, they're talking about painting and where to put the uh, all the decals and stuff on it and then how here's the Israeli Defense Force one you can just see it's it's a lot more in depth than the uh, the older Aurora kits and then when we flip it over we've kind of jumped to our uh, pictograms where you can see each thing there is still a lot of a lot of verbiage underneath each one showing how to put it together and then of course I love the little cartoons about too much glue and you'll soften the heck out of your model and destroy it. And also the same thing with uh, no lacquer paints. Uh, lacquer paints will eat the plastic. And then finally, the little joke down here. Only experienced modelers should attempt rigging of the antenna line. And I'm like, experienced modelers? Wow, that's kind of a basic thing right there. But you get the general idea on it. And we won't tear through completely on this because it's... You know, the technology is very, very similar to the uh, the other company. But uh, we'll spend a few seconds here. Right off, got the runner all the way around protecting the model. But it is recessed panel lines on this kit. So that isn't, I mean, they're ridiculously huge. But still, for the 1960s, pretty cool looking. see all of that there and let's pull this one out let's see did they do it yeah they didn't they didn't put all the markings on this airplane so it was just a matter of putting the decals on now the wings this is weird the fuselage was uh, recessed panel lines but the wings are all raised panel lines Maybe you can see it right there and obviously doing recessed panel lines in reverse in the mold costs a lot more money so I guess all they were wanting to do well, and it's funny, it's on the same mold, but I guess they just thought, yeah, the upper wing is fine. And I guess I am showing you the entire kit. It wasn't as much in here as I thought. So here's the uh, the black plastic parts. Now it said it was molded in three colors, so I wonder if they're counting the clear canopy as being a separate color, because I'm only seeing the three different, uh, two sprues of silver, one sprue of black. And finally, we're going to take a look at a, another old vintage kit from the Limburg line. And this is the Curtis Gosshawk. 
it too is let's see what scale is this here yeah okay one quarter scale now they didn't put the inch markings on it but we're going to assume that this is quarter inch scale or 48 scale and then we'll kind of briefly just show you these first i could not find a date on this kit anywhere just when i started to film this so we're going to assume it's from the general time period of those other two you can see lots of advertising on one thing and then talking about the actual kit itself and then when we flip it over a little bit more in-depth instructions than the aurora kit but not as much as i would say as the hawk kit so what do you guys think um i'm thinking maybe early 60s on this one right here and there it is still advertising their cement and so that's what I wanted to do on these on this video was to show you three different brands from about the same time period that if you were a kid back in the uh, late 50s, early 60s, you'd walk into a hobby store and this is what you'd find on the shelf. And then we'll, of course, take a look at the plastic too. Nice ribbing on the top here. And, and when I say something is nice, I got to point out to this because I know people are going to say that. Obviously, compared to today's standards, these are very weak, but... But think about it for 1950s, 1960s. This is actually very nicely done for that time period. And if you build them and paint them properly, I think they would look really good on display. So still no markings molded into the plastic, but we don't have the runners around the outside. So that's another kind of giveaway. Uh, if I'm not mistaken, Aurora started doing that like in 62. And by 64, most of the kits were all done that way. So we're probably talking early 60s based on looking at the way the parts were done. And we've got the other side just like that. The upper wing. And then, of course, whoop, we've got this piece here. So very similar. Very a center uh, sprue and all the parts coming off of that. And finally, I want to show you this piece. This is actually not too bad for the time period, the way they molded this, to have all of the engine detail. And of course, the clear parts, which we have our... Well, there you are, there's a walk down memory lane I hope you guys enjoyed. Um, I know I have a question for you. What is the oldest model kit, or the first model kit, if you can remember that, that you ever built? Uh, the very oldest one and the first one I believe I built was in the uh, the mid 70s when the monogram p61 black widow in 148 scale had come out that i absolutely remember building that airplane and flying it around my grandmother's house once i got it done but please in the comment section down below go ahead and tell me what the oldest kit you ever built and about the time period too so so i want to take this opportunity to thank you as always for watching and please stay tuned because we have many more videos coming